Rami, let's say you have a patient who has lower risk MDS um, and who has anemia. Um, you, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the treatment options, including uh, immunomodulatory agents or immunosuppressive therapy or growth factors? Sure. So I think obviously the first step you look at, which we discussed, is are they symptomatic, they need treatment or not. Once you think that you need treatment to restore hematopoiesis, the next step is, is it an isolated anemia, pure anemia only, or there is also cytopenias. Sometimes other cytopenias may be the indication for treatment, which is not common, but they sometimes could impact your choice of the treatment for the anemia as well. So if a platelet are 60 or 50, they probably don't need a treatment for the thrombocytopenia per se, but they may impact your choice of the treatment for the anemia. So I think if somebody's anemic, the first step is still very acceptable to look at, as mentioned, their transfusion burdens, if they're getting blood, their endogenous serum EPO level. And if uh, the EPO level is less than 500, most you know, time those patients have relatively good chance of response to erythroid stimulating agents. So that's usually the first step. I, I think the summary of the use of ESA agents, whether one is sh using short acting or long acting, probably they are, you know, almost equivalent. Uh, I think it's reasonable to give a good try of 8 to 12 weeks. If there is a response, you continue. If it's not, then you stop. A starting dose should be probably equivalent to a 40,000 of uh, erythropoietin short acting, uh, and then could be up to 60,000. Europeans tend to go more with the 60,000, then they escalate down. Uh, one step would add, be adding also growth factor like GCSF, uh, and that's really been, in European studies, have been shown to double the erythroid response, so it's not for neutropenia, it's for the anemia. Um, and with that, you know, the responses have been reported to be doubled. The studies did this on daily basis. In real practice, it's very difficult. I do it, like if I try it, I try it once a week. Every now and then, that's a trick that could work, uh, but, um, you know, the bone pain and the limitations of if, if doing it on more frequent basis really make it not an optimal choice for all patients. So once we decide on ESAs, if they did not work or if the patients had a response and then there was an ESA failure, then we look at other options. Obviously, in the lower risk, the current available options are you know, immunosuppressive therapy, uh, lenalidomide, and hypomethylating agents. I, I still think that if there is a clinical trial, it's absolutely okay and acceptable to be the first step after ESA failure. It doesn't have to be one of the current approved drugs. So if we have a study, we consider patients to study. Uh, the selection for ATG, cyclosporin, or immunosuppressive therapy, which is really underutilized treatment in MDS, depends on most likely patient age, their transfusion burden, and HLA-DR15 status. This is what at least the NIH model suggested, that patients younger than age of 60 uh, probably have the highest chance of response, and I, I definitely think that's valid. In our experience, and we both have been on, contributed to studies using rabbit ATG, equine ATG, I, I think also it matters where is it applied in the disease. It's usually much higher responses in the first couple of years of the disease. Later on, you probably see less. So I think it's a very acceptable choice to think in younger patients. The advantages, it's one course of treatment. Patients could get durable responses for a year or two, and uh, you could get trilineage responses. We tried recently to look on the molecular uh, mutations and their impact to response to ATG cyclosporin. And basically, those that had SF3B1 mutation actually had less chance of response. Uh, presence of mutations did not predict much the response, yes or no, but it did predict a little bit loss, less durable responses and higher chance of transformation, regardless of the mutation. Uh, lenalidomide use, obviously, Dishon 5Q, everybody knows about it. It's the standard of care, 67% transfusion independence. So I, I think that's set now that people use it. Uh, the question how to use it in non deletion 5Q. And I think that we have several studies that showed around 25 to 30 percent responses of transfusion independency with non deletion 5Q. So we look usually at patients that are purely anemic. So if I have patients with platelets of 50, non deletion 5Q, I may not go for lenalidomide because I think thrombocytopenia baseline could predict a response for those patients. So I look at patients that are just purely anemic, and if that's the case, I think lenalidomide is a reasonable option uh, where you could get around 30 percent responses. We also try to look at the sequence uh, of using those therapies. Do you use lenalidomide? might be for hypomethylators or not. Again, this is single institution experience that we are trying also to look at within the MDS consortium. The bottom line, many of the, all, all the endomide studies that were done, patients did not have hypomethylating agents on the study before lenalidomide. So we looked at patients that got hypomethylating agents first and then lenalidomide, and the responses were much less. In our experience, it was like 13% versus lenalidomide first, the responses were in the range of 30%, which has been reported. 
is the cited in responses whether we're first line or second line were the same. So in our mind, like we, when we sequence those, if patients are purely anemic and I'm gonna use lenalidomide, I will use it before a hypomethylating agent. Finally, hypomethylating agents end to be the default for many patients when all other options did not work for anemia. If they have thrombocytopenia or neutropenia, probably they are a choice. What we've learned also recently that uh, you know, there is some encouraging data about shorter courses of use of hypomethylators. And at time of hypomethylators failures, even in the lower risk, the outcome is poor. So we tend now a little bit to be a little bit more conservative about using them. Mm -hmm. I went so long, I probably should stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, a, it was a good description of the different types of therapies. I, w I wanted to pile on a little bit about the uh, use of ATG. Um, we, we did both participate in a phase two study in the U.S. in which we basically enrolled patients who had refractory cytopenia with multilineage dysplasia. So not your textbook patients who have a hypocellular bone marrow, mm -hmm. or, and we didn't enroll based on HLA-DR status, mm -hmm. and uh, had a response rate of 32%. That was eerily similar to the European experience, which is a randomized phase three study in which patients got ATG and cyclosporine versus supportive care, and, and they had all, uh, the identical response rate. And I, I, to me, it always validates a response rate if you're seeing it in two different continents and two different patient populations. Um, what was really neat about the, uh, our ATG experience is, is that a patient's admitted to the hospital for four days, is then discharged on a prednisone taper for 30 days to avoid the serum sickness reaction, and then is on almost homeopathic doses of cyclosporin long term. And you will see these folks who basically had to endure a four-day hospitalization to then get, uh, on average, about a year and a half of response. Um, so the classic teaching about looking for a hypocellular marrow, I think, really doesn't necessarily hold with ATG. My ideal patient is someone who at age 70 says to me, you know, the funniest thing, two years ago I was diagnosed with having a, a, a low thyroid function and I started to develop this eczema. Right, so other stigmata of autoimmune conditions that can signal to you that they may have an autoimmune destruction of the bone marrow as well that's contributing to their, their MDS picture. And I would agree with that, and I, I typically get a PNH clone testing mm -hmm. as well in people who have low risk MDS and possibly hypocellular, uh, because that too would support the uh, utilization of immunosuppressive therapy. Now, I, I haven't used ATG cyclosporine in older individuals. I might try cyclosporine as a single mm -hmm. uh, agent, and actually have had some reasonable successes with that. I realize that combination is better than either one alone, and it's been shown in trials, but that would be the other thing I do. Well, it's a challenge in the really older patient in the 80s, you mm -hmm. know, for example, to, to use ATG. So I have also used uh, you know, cyclosporin alone in some of those patients and have done well. I think it's important to try and avoid, especially in lower risk patients, going to a hypomethylating agent for as long as possible. Because once a patient fails a hypomethylating agent, we really don't have a good solution for them. So I always worry about putting a lower risk patient on a hypomethylating agent because I've, I've already played my deck of cards. I, you know, all I have is a possible clinical trial drug at the end of it that may or may not work. So you play your whole hand and you, you have not a whole lot left. So I really try and avoid in those lower risk patients moving to the hypomethylating agent for as long as I can. So I think we're emphasizing the same theme here. We have three drugs FDA approved for MDS, and then there are two others that we use off-label, and that's the erythropoiesis stimulating agents, or ATG. And we think about MDS, particularly lower risk MDS, long term, and don't want to spend all of our drugs up front, so tend to take the approach of offering clinical trials to our patients when they're available because we'll always have the other drugs available to us.